right. It is so good to see you guys this morning. My name is Nathaniel Coons, and I work at the Southern Baptist of Texas Convention. But about 10 years ago, I was in a communications class at Trinity Valley Community College, and this goofy fella came and sat beside me in the class. Um, he ended up beating me. We've talked about this. I'm still not bitter, but uh, that individual was Josh Holcomb. Um, and so 10 years ago, almost almost 10, maybe 11 years ago, uh, it was a joy that I was just out of high school trying to figure out what I was doing with my life. He said, hey, I'll buy you tacos uh, from Taco Bell if you come help me at the student ministry after we're done here. I was like, done. Like, what else do I need more with my life? If he covers my lunch, I'll go, I'll follow you anywhere. Um, but it was one of those that that's when, when Josh and I met, and then we worked together for a couple years, and we've been friends ever since. And so it is a joy and an honor and a privilege, one, to be here uh, kind of wrapping up this weekend, uh, but also to, to see familiar faces and new faces, because just to, I want to brag on the parents just for a little bit. Uh, the, the students have been incredible this week. Um, they have been attentive, they have been engaging in worship, that when we've opened up the Word, they've opened up the Scriptures with, and they've been honed in. And I know that is because of you guys and just your love of praying for them and investing in them over their years of their life. And so I just, from an outsider coming in, I just want to say thank you uh, for what you're doing and in investing in this next generation. And students, this church loves you um, to, to throw a weekend like this together for you and just the sole reason of just getting to know Christ more. Um, this is a special place and a special church, so I hope that you don't take that uh, for granted. But this morning what we're going to do, we're going to be wrapping up our series in Second Peter. Uh, and so Second Peter chapter 3 is where we find ourselves um, this morning. And what we're going to be doing is this, all throughout this weekend, um, we've been looking at this last letter that Peter wrote to these churches, and with that, He's been writing them and reminding them of gospel truth, but then also alerting them and letting them be aware that there are false teachers amongst them and that they need to hone in on truth. And with that, that is where freedom comes from Jesus. And so this morning, what we've done uh, in any of this past weekend, we've looked at different questions to examine our own hearts coming out of such a tough, hard season, honestly still walking through it, trying to figure out what these next couple months look like. Um, it, it is a hard season for us, and we're just so tossed to and fro. It seems like every day there's something new that comes up, new information, or this wasn't right, or this, that, and the other. And, and so what we need to do, and we've had questions to examine our own hearts to see exactly where we are now, to be open and honest with ourselves of, of where is my relationship with Jesus? Do I have a relationship with Jesus and with that, how do I grow in that? And so this morning, we're, we're going to wrap it all up in Second Peter chapter 3. But the question of this morning is simply this. Is Christ enough for you? So is Christ enough for you? So what that means is simply this. That depending on the answer to that question, these next eight, uh, these next five or six verses that we read, are going to dictate how you interpret those verses. Because is Christ enough for you if you are um, a believer over here? That is, is he enough for you that in these moments of time that your life looks differently from those who don't know him? And then for those that are looking and seeking and trying to find truth that don't know him, that the, is Christ enough? Is that something that I could grab onto and just build the rest of my life around that solid truth? And so have this in your mind that as we walk through these verses, that question, we're going to come back to it multiple times, that is Christ enough for me? That genuinely at the deep root, when, when everything else is stripped away, that when all the masks and the, the smiling faces of, of how's your week been, it's been good. No, it hasn't. It's been a hard week. That when you stop and you pause and you're honest with yourself before the Lord, can you say that he is truly enough for you? I have to do that every single day. We have to do that as believers. Be reminded of the gospel truth. And within that, no, yes, he is enough. He is far more than anything that I could ever have, want, or need. So with that mindset, we're going to jump into verse 8. 
So chapter 3, verse 8 of 2 Peter says this, But do not look, overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but all, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. And then in verse 11, since all these sayings are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in the lives of holiness and godliness? Waiting for your hastening, the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. And then in verse 13, but according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Let's pray just real quick. God, we come to you this morning. We would come to you open. We would come to you just humble, just at the opportunity to gather as a people to open up your word. And God, I pray this morning that our hearts would be softened to your word. That the distractions would be laid aside. That, that what's waiting for us outside of these doors on Monday morning, God, that we would give our full focus to you in this moment. God, that you would be glorified in this. And with that, God, that our lives would be changed. We need you to show up. In your name we pray. Amen. So what we see in verse 9 is this. That the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but all should reach repentance. That is the heart of the gospel. In this time that there were people and teachers saying, man, Jesus said that he was going to come back. Where is he? They were questioning and they were doubting and trying to go at saying, he, okay, so he was dead and he raised and he's going to come back again. But where is he? We don't see him around us. And so what was going on is all of a sudden the believers were starting to, to lose sight of what it is that God, had, what Jesus had done in their lives. And they were beginning to believe these lies. That they were replacing truth for lies. And Peter's reminding them, hey, don't, don't look at this in the wrong light. That the slowness that man sees as God is actually his patience working out through his church and his people so that none should perish but all should be able to reach repentance, should have an opportunity to confess Jesus Christ as their Lord. So he's saying, don't get this mixed up. This is crucial. This is important. Because at the root of this, what they're trying to do is discredit God's word. They're, they're trying to discredit Jesus saying that he's going to come back, but he's not back yet. And so within that, trying to use those small little avenues to create doubt inside of our minds. That maybe I interpreted this thing wrong. That, that maybe Jesus didn't really mean exactly what he said. And there's just these little lines of just doubt that come in. And the most subtle of ways that, gr that just grow over time. And Peter's saying, be aware of that. Recognize that because God's heart is this, that that all should reach repentance. And so if Christ is enough for you, there's a few marks that we see in our own lives and, and in these verses that I want to highlight and draw our attention to this morning. The first one of this is that if Christ is enough for you, you view life differently. Then when Christ is enough for you, your whole worldview shifts. Because no longer is it me-centric, what can I get out of the world, but it's, it's God is doing something and I want to be a part of it. That, that something is going on around me and I need to tune in to what that is. We see in verse, um, in Job, hold on, no, verse 11. So in verse 11, so, so since all these things are thus being dissolved, what sort of people ought you be in lives of holiness and godliness? That what sort of people should I be knowing that God's doing something, that he is enough, he is so much more than I could ever need. He's so much more, he's so much more than I could ever, I don't deserve. That there's a different calling on our life in that moment, that we view the world differently. And a perfect example of this is in Job chapter 42. You don't have to fill it there. We've got it on the screen for you. But in Job chapter 42, this is the very end of Job's 
of Job's saga, of everything was stripped away from him in Job chapter 1, that his family, his wealth, his comfort, his health in some ways were taken from him, and then all of a sudden starts his 41-chapter journey of Job and God wrestling back and forth. Job has some friends that come and give him terrible advice, and God says, hey, don't listen to them, press into me. And so we get to the very end of Job chapter 42, and look at what it says here starting in verse 4. This is Job's uh, prayer of confession and repentance. It says, hear and I will speak. I will question you and you make it known to me. You see just the honesty of a point of, of wrestling with God and really struggling and being open and honest that it leads to a point of, of just complete openness. And we see in verse 5, it says, I, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Verse 6, therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Look back up at verse 5. It says, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. There's a difference between hearing about God and then having our eyes open and seeing him moving in our lives. It makes it real. It makes it something to where all of a sudden we see the holiness of God and we see the wickedness inside of our own selves. It's, we just get a little bit of a glimpse of the true character and the nature of God that draws us in closer to him. Because we know that we're, there's nothing good inside of us apart from him. And that we, we see, by the, we've heard of him, but yet we see him. And in that, we lead to repentance in verse 6. This has been a season of absolute hardship. My, my wife and I moved from Houston uh, to Dallas in the middle of all of this. Praise the Lord that movers are essential workers. Um, or I just would have left everything in Houston and just bought some camping chairs, and that would have been our furniture. And, but during that time, we, we moved into just a small little one-bedroom, saving up for, to buy a house. And we're like, if we're going to do this, we'll just do it right. Let's get a small one-bedroom. Uh, we didn't think or know about a pandemic coming. And so all of a sudden, there was two months. I'm an extreme extrovert, uh, and she is an introvert. And then she's my only outlet of people communication. Uh, and so let's just say the very first day, uh, this, is, this is true. This is, this is truth. If she was sitting here, I would say the exact same thing. Uh, she has made my lunch one time um, in the morning. And it was the day that my office opened back up. Um, and she said, hey, honey, here's your lunch. Um, are you ready to go? And I'm like, thanks. But then I was like, oh, come on now. And so I was like, but that's cool. So I went to work anyway, bugged all of them, got zero work done. Uh, but it's just been one of those seasons of just hardship because everything that we've busied our life around has been stripped away from us. I'm a person that keeps myself busy to neglect having to really deal and wrestle with things with God. That if I keep my mind busy thinking about what's next, then all of a sudden I don't have to worry about what he's trying to do in the here and now. I'm always trying to look forward. But yet that was stripped away for all of us. To where if you look too far in the forward, all of a sudden stress and anxiety just weighed and just poured down on you. And it was a moment for me and probably for a lot of you as well to where we really had to genuinely stop. We had heard about God. We, we had heard so many sermons about God, podcasts and songs and, and reading through the scripture. But yet in this season, we got to see him in a new and unique way, that he met us where we were. And in those moments, peace came. In those moments that we don't know what's going to happen to our retirement fund, but yet I know God is here with me now, and that's enough for me. And so our worldview completely changes whenever Christ is enough for us. So whenever Christ is enough for us, for me, for you, you, you view life differently, but also you have a joy that is unspeakable. A joy that's unspeakable. If you look in 2 Peter 13, it says this. It says, but according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Well, as I was studying and preparing, I, I read through 2 Peter a couple times, and I just kind of glimpsed over this verse, and then, on Wednesday, as I was preparing, all of a sudden, those words popped out on that his promises 
what is that? That we're waiting for a new heaven and a new earth in which what? His righteousness dwells. Let's not be fast to move past that. That we know hope is on the horizon. That we know that Jesus is going to be coming back. And there's a joy that comes within that. But yet the joy is not that we're leaving this world behind. It's what we're gaining. Is what that rich is. That richness of the dwelling of the presence of God. That for all of eternity we'll finally be able to be physically in the same place with him. And we'll just be singing of his praises. And I just think of that, that glory and just that majesty in that moment. It makes me think back, um, 2014, I, took a, I just graduated college, and I moved up to, to Dallas to start interning at a church. Uh, and my family was a family that, that we never went to the doctor if we were sick. We were the old stubborn type of take Tylenol and sleep it off and you'll be fine. So much to the point to where I had kidney stones. Anyone have a kidney stone before? No? Good. Do not ever, like, drink a lot of water. I had, I had twins on this side. Um, and so I thought I'd just pulled a muscle. And so I went a month without going to the doctor. I just took Tylenol and a heating pad, and it was terrible. Um, and so we were, we were a family that didn't go to the doctor. We didn't go to the dentist. We, we brushed our teeth. Like, that's, we, we did that. Uh, but we didn't go unless we needed to. And so when I moved up to, to Dallas to start interning at a church and start my master's at Southwestern, um, I knew that my dad had had a few surgeries and some things that were going on um, in his life. But once again, we were very passive in communication of if we just don't bring it up, we don't have to worry about it. It will just kind of make its way uh, and we'll be okay. And, and so I move up um, and then my truck's transmission dies on me. So I switch vehicles with my, my mom while that, my truck's in the shop. And then uh, about September, we, we switch vehicles again. And it was in that moment that I've, I've started to see something a little different. Uh, that my dad had dropped a little bit of weight, um, and his balance was a little bit off. I'm like, that, that's interesting. Maybe, you know, just recovery from one of the surgeries or something like that. It was never brought up again. Uh, and then in October, uh, I got a phone call uh, from my mom saying, hey, your, your dad's in, in hospice care now. Um, if you have an opportunity, could you just, just come home for a couple weeks so the church I was at was gracious to give me two weeks, um, and I went to went back home and just got to spend time with my dad. It ends up that he had um, obtained, a, he was a pastor, uh, but on the side, he was also a paramedic as well. Um, that's just what he liked to do. And along the way, somewhere, an open cut working a scene that he had, he had gotten a blood disease from somebody that he was working on, uh, and it doesn't have a cure. There's just medicine that just kind of slows the the. Um, just the progression of the disease. And so by the time I got, I got home, my dad was in and out of consciousness. Um, and so I just was able to sit there uh, beside his bed in the living room. And I just did my seminary homework. Once again, busy my mind to where I don't have to think about things. Uh, and so in seminary, you just read and write papers. And that's just what I did the whole time. I read out loud. Um, my dad would kind of make jokes here and there. And he would go back to sleep and all these different things. And so the realization and the understanding of what was going on was starting to kind of hit home with me. And so the end of my two weeks comes up, and then all of a sudden I'm like, all right, Dad, um, I have to go. I don't know if you can really hear me right now, but I just want to let you know I love you. Uh, stay out of trouble. Like, don't do anything I wouldn't do. Uh, I'm trying to use humor just for me to cope in that moment. Uh, and, and in that moment, he, he looked up at me, and, and I'll never forget, he, he just touched me on the, the hand real gently, and he just said two words, and those two words were just joy unspeakable. He, he said joy unspeakable. And those two words rocked me. Absolutely just rocked me to the core. I got in my truck and I was driving back up to Dallas. And honestly, it got me to a point to where I was angry with God. Of man, God, here is a man on his deathbed that everything is about to be taken away from him. I was looking at it from my perspective. My little brother was a senior. And my older brother was about to have his first daughter. And in this moment, I knew that he wasn't going to be able to see any of those things. My, he was only 40, 47 years old at that time. I'm like, man, just all these things that are being taken away. But in that moment, he looked at me and he just said, joy unspeakable. Why? Because he understood this verse right here. 
the, the promise of God he was holding on to, that he was going to go to a place in which righteousness dwells. And we see that in Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 17 through 19. And these are verses I clung to, and these are verses I cling to now. And it says, Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, sum it all up, everything was going wrong. But notice what Habakkuk says in verse 18. It says, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. That verse 18, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. If there is something, when Christ is enough for us, that there is a joy that we have that is unspeakable. We can't put it into words. That when the world sees us walking through hardships, all of a sudden they see something different in us, not because of who we are, but because Christ dwells richly inside of us. And from that, there is a joy, not a happiness, but a joy of something better on the horizon. That there's a God who loves me that's never going to leave me or forsake me. I'm in my lowest of lows, but yet he loves me where I am. That he, he desires for me to be on high places, but yet he's in the valleys with me. That there is a joy that comes from knowing that God loves you. So much to the point where he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for your sins, for my sins. So that we might be able to walk in relationship with him. There's a joy that comes when Christ is enough in our life. And when we understand those first two things, that when we view life differently, when we understand that we have a joy that is unspeakable, that this world can't even come close to matching, it drives us to a point of action. And that's exactly what we see in um, this last point, that there's nothing will stand in your way of sharing the gospel. That when you understand that when you understand this, the joy that comes from knowing him, that hope, that freedom that the slaves and the chains of, that we were enslaved to, that we can lay them aside and walk just with, oh, just to be able to take a deep breath. And then when we understand that we view life differently, all of a sudden that viewing life differently is we see those who don't know him, and we should have a burden inside of ourselves to share the gospel with that person. That there should be nothing that stops us or gets in the way of sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with those who don't know him. We should want them to have what we want. We should have open hands, not hold on to it tight that I'm good, I'll be okay. No, we should be able to open up, just see, come look and see what I have. Let me share with you. We see in Romans chapter 9, starting in verse 1, Paul says, I am speaking the truth in Christ. He says, I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. Stop right there. That, that sorrow and great un, and the anguish unceasing in his heart. That when is the last time we've truly felt that for someone who didn't know him? Because we get so blindsided. We see in chapter 1 uh, and verse, uh, the, the end of verse 8 and 9 of, of, first, of Second Peter that we get so blindsided that we're not growing in our own faith, that we're, we're, we're blind to what it is that God is doing around us. And it hardens us to those that are around us that don't know him. Look at what Paul says here in verse 3. He says, for I, wish I could, I could, for I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. That Paul is to a point that he so desires his people to know God. That he says, I wish I could cut myself off from him for the, just for the, the glimpse and the hope that they may know him. He viewed the world differently, not as I'm good, I've got a safety net, I'll be okay on the other side of this. No, he saw the world as what it was. And when Jesus was approaching Jerusalem, that he had sorrow upon the people because they were like a sheep. They were like a sheep without a shepherd. They were just wandering around, just trying to find and grab on to make their identity 
and know that Jesus had sorrow and anguish, and Paul right here is saying the exact same thing, that we should have that for those that are lost, that we should be so bold to open our mouths and share the gospel. It's easy to say, but man, it is hard to do. That there are people in our life that, that God puts in our place so that we can open our mouth, that he gives us the opportunity to join him in his work of seeing the nations redeemed, that we would just be bold enough just to proclaim what we know. But yet we, we let things come into our lives. We let the idea, all of these unknown questions before we even open our mouth of what if they ask this, I don't know the answer to that, so I'm not going to say anything. Or what are they going to think of me as soon as, how's this going to hurt my relationship as soon as I open up my mouth and talk to them about Jesus? We let these things just slowly go into our mind and it just hardens our heart to what it is that God is doing around us. And in Mark chapter 2, Mark chapter 2, we see four people that they weren't going to let anything stand in the way from sharing the gospel with an individual. So this is a common story that we most of us know. But in Mark chapter 2, starting in verse 1, it says this. And when he returned, the he being Jesus, to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came, bringing with them a paralytic man, uh, carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they made him an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lie. And Jesus saw their faith and said to the man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now this is a story growing up in church and Sunday school that I've heard multiple and multiple times. But when I read it just a couple months ago, God opened my eyes to something new. Because in, in the picture, I always saw there were just two people in the story. Because in, in the, the narrative of the scripture, it tells us about who God is, but yet at times, um, it's, it's how I kind of interpret, like, where do I fit in? Not that it's about me, but where would, where would have I been in this story if I would have been there when Jesus was teaching? And my mind always goes to two different people. There, there are the four men that are carrying, and then there's the one that's, that's lame, and he can't get to Jesus himself. But if you read there again, there's a whole other group of people there. That sadly, I think, and God really convicted me that I fall into this group of people more. In my mind, I always like to try to be the hero. We always try to look at the good in ourselves, do we not? If I would be that one, if I saw that guy, I would be that one that would grab a corner of the mat and help carry. But there's a whole other group of people that we see here in verse 4. It says that they could not get near him, Jesus, because of the crowd. Because of the crowd, they couldn't even get this man close to where Jesus was. And I know from my own life, so a lot of the times, I'm a part of that crowd. I'm trying to press in so much, worried about myself, that I just want to hear a little bit more from Jesus. That if I can just scrunch a little bit closer to where he is, maybe I can Get, understand his character a little bit more, that maybe if I, if I get just a little bit closer. But what I'm doing in that moment is I have my back completely turned to the world that needs to hear him, that I am so focused about if I can get just a little bit closer, then I'll be okay, instead of recognizing the, the needs of the people around me and bringing them along with me to, to share the gospel to them where they are. That when Christ is enough for us, there's nothing will let stand in our way of sharing the gospel. That you view life differently. That there's a joy that comes from knowing him. And that there's nothing that will stop us from sharing that goodness with those around us. And those are the last words that we see Peter encouraging this church. He's stirring them up. In verse 12, it says in chapter 1, this is a reminder to you that after his departure that we may be able to recall these things. And so, church, this morning, where do you fall on this scale? 
going back to that very first question, is Christ enough for you? That if you find yourself here this morning and you're just, you don't know how you got through those doors. That if you, you come here and you just feel there's an emptiness inside of your heart. And Jesus is the answer. He is enough to meet you where you are, no matter what it is that you've walked through those doors with. He loves us all equally. That if we just open our mouths and we confess Jesus as Lord and repent from our sins, that we will be saved. It's not repent of your sins or get, get your life cleaned up and then you may be saved. No, it's, it's just on that confession of who Jesus is and what he did on that cross 2,000 years ago. That when he said, it is finished in Hebrews chapter 2, that, that in that moment he defeated death so that we would have an opportunity to have a relationship with God. And if you're in this room this morning, and you know you've put your trust in Jesus Christ, but yet what we've done is let these different outside influences rock us to the point to where you really get down and you strip everything away. You are adding things to Christ. That Christ is good enough, but I need this. I need this type of security in my job. I need my health to be this way. And we attach things to Christ. And when we do that, we're taking away from his true power and authority in our life. And so this morning may be a morning of where, where you need to stop and truly examine and say, what is it that I've put next to Christ in my life? Is it Christ in my job? Christ in my family? Christ and whatever that thing is, that this needs to be dropped away and our lives just need to be focused on him. Because when we do that, everything else will fall into place the way that he plans it to be for us. And so this morning, what we're going to do, we're just going to have a time of just extended prayer and examination of our, of our own hearts this morning. That if you need, instead of standing here in a little bit and singing songs, if you just need to sit where you are, if you need to come up here and pray, whatever it is, you would do that. That if... Maybe for you, you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That you, you heard this message, you heard that, man, there's a place where righteousness dwells. That, that he's coming like a thief, that his, his justice will come at a day. And you just look, and you're like, man, I've been running from something, and I've realized it's been him that I'm running from. That maybe this morning is the morning that you put your trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And it's as simple as this, just saying, Jesus, I need you. to be my Savior. I believe in you. I trust in you. And from there, man, turn from your sin and just follow hard after him. So this is what we're going to do. If you'll just close your uh, eyes and bow your heads. Just take these next few moments And ask that question to yourself honestly. Is Christ enough for me?